Enjoying the sights and sounds and uh, beverages of the city uh, last night. Uh, for those of you that came to the reception last night, I think we had a pretty good time. Thanks for coming. Um, so today's session we have broken up uh, as we did yesterday with uh, discussions among uh, people that are actually doing real things with uh, models and software in the morning. And those of us building tools to help you do those things uh, after that. So uh, this morning's session, uh, I've asked Anabhav Bagley to uh, moderate. And uh, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Paul. Well, I'm new at this thing, so. But I was told yesterday that I've been at MAG forever. <laughs> <laughs> but just to start off, uh, we, I saw Paul at a uh, Portland conference in 2000, and that was the time Paul was first. That was the first time I was exposed to urban sim and what was going on and all that. And we were very impressed. So we got on the bandwagon with urban sim somewhere started 2006, seven, and we'll go into all kinds of details on our side. But I was just making a list of which other agencies are using and currently are planning on and working with urban sim, and I know. Mr. Cog, I'm going to call it Mr. Cog. Mr. Cog's mm -hmm. here, BSRC's here, WFRC's here, Sam Cog. I don't see, I don't see Sean here, but Wong Yu is here. Uh, Mike, so we've got MTC A bag. So we'll just kind of go through when I follow the agenda and kind of go through this and then start keeping this informal in terms of just keep keep asking questions on how do you deal with this because at the end of the day, I kind of see everybody in the same boat. We've, we've kind of we have run into the same kind of issues, whether on the data or some particular pieces. And uh, time and again, we keep bugging Paul or Liming or Hana or whoever is helping us with that. So, Andy, turning it over to you, do you want to get it started? So, good morning, everyone. Uh, as said, I think I'm also very, very excited to see so many people interested in Lopez Lopez or even working on Lopez. So this will be a very short presentation and basically it is a work progress. 
So as some of you know that I'm working with the Wasatch Front Regional Council in the Great Salt Lake area, Utah, and below. This is one of the fastest growth areas in the United States. So from 2011 to 2014, the population almost grew, grew about 50%. So in this, in this map, the blue area is uh, Great Salt Lake, and uh, the, the green area is the Weaver and the Davis County urbanized areas, and so, uh, pink is the Salt Lake County urbanized area. And uh, the north south road is I-15, which connects the, the Canada and the San Diego, and the east and west is the I-80, connecting here to the New York City. So WFC has a long history about uh, the latest modeling. Before 2004, we used uh, the spreadsheet methodology for the social economic forecasting. Then we used the 2000, in 2005, we used the Urbison for a for such a choice, 2014. Basically, it is a regional visioning process. And then in 2006 and 2009, we used the Urbison as a tool for the regional transportation plan. But currently, we are using the, the manual allocation plus the ET plus evaluation software. Basically, it's an ambition model software. And we hope we can use the Opus for the 20, in 2050 for the 2090 to 2040. So the land use models in our region needed to think about the future land use model platforms. In late 2011, we spent uh, several months in looking into the potential land use modeling platforms for our regions. After discussing with Mike and others, we shortened our list into three possibilities. Upgrade the, the algorithm to the new platform locus, or choose other model platforms such as a city that's equivalent, or even develop a own platform. I think most of you know this chart. Actually, it is from a 2009 Angus model survey from Frederick area MTO. So, this high chart shows a lot. Varieties of different measures, model platforms, and obviously, Urbison is a single software winner. I think that now, 2013, this year should be larger than 15. So, in order to understand the language practice in the United States, we conducted a technical interview survey with. 10 or 10 to 15 agencies try to understand the model and the experience. So um, basically we ask them very detailed questions such as you know, why they chose those platforms and what the resources are needed for that platform and our technical question. So if these are our technical criteria used that we evaluate different options. So the data input, whether it's easy or very hard or almost impossible, whether the user interface is friendly or not, how much resources needed to develop or apply the model, how is the output presentation forms and other tools, building tools, and definitely the theoretical methodologies. So Opus has a lot of aspects, theoretical methodology, open source, then maybe it will be changed. This is a big user community, a lot of building tools, including uh, yesterday's initial stuff and uh, QGIS. So Opus can be, as I understand, it can be used at a different geography level from the TNZ block, free sale, Person. So in order to make that decision for our region, we spend a little time look at our region's structure. So this is the, our model here. Basically, it includes the, the WFRC urbanized area and also the Utah County, which is the uh, 
Montenegro, Association of Province. Yeah. So uh, in our region, we have 20 to 50 TACs. This is the TAC structure in Bountiful, east of I-15. <coughs> and uh, this, we have uh, 38,000 rocks, uh, 50,000 gray cells, and 760,000 uh, fossils. So every geography level has different rocks and clones. The fossil level model has, um, I think, is pretty close to the reality. In the reality the process, and the fossil level only has one fossil, and the developer will usually develop the one fossil by fossil. And the, uh, but if data is a, a big problem, I think it's a little lot of the data process. And the TAC level is consistent with the uh, travel demand model, which is mostly the, uh, the land use model itself will be used for. And they think it, it is too aggregate for the land use details. So, this is the chart from 2003 or 2004 um, the urban test results. And uh, the urban sum involved uh, randoms, randomness or uncertainty. So, through the years, the uncertainty or the random become bigger and bigger. The blue line is the three cell, and the purple line is the TAC level. So the frog level should be the between, and I think the cost will be higher, much higher. Things. So the the frog level model is is a compromise between the TAC and the parcel for the critical level. But it makes the data collection and the process much easier. So the MPOs, which include the WRC and the MAC in Utah, so we have only like one to two staff, full time staff who can work for the language model. The budget is still very limited. The data is part of the process. And then the main purpose of the language modeling now is still for the regional transportation plan or uh, capital big projects. So our recommendation is to still work, continue working on the focus but at the broad level. So with help from Paul, our um, with our preliminary data, the focus is uh, software is set for us. And uh, with the help of one, two, two, five interests in the last year, the basic data is almost ready. So we will, we will start working on the calibration and estimation soon. Get the help, get the help from Paul and the mind. So, uh, thank you. It's a pretty shot. Thanks, Andy. Uh, any questions for Andy? I have a couple of them. Oh. Can you kind of I think the data is pretty close, just the uh, different geography because, for example, we collect the data from our census, from our counties assess data, and from our it's about the workforce department data for the, for the companies, the patient data. So because the geography changed from the grid cell to the rock, so the, the process data, we need to process all the data to uh, uh, but especially for the household side, because it's about census data, so it's really ready. But we just need to check, make sure we use the intern to check, make sure the household side side the data is pretty good. But still, for the same thing we did last time, the floor phase zoning coordinate, 
we have learned, learned source is the same. Just the way we process, the way we use it. Also, we would pre present the output. For example, somebody will point it to a specific process and say, hey, 2014, why this one will be built so many and whatever? But the, in a broad level, it's much easier to express. Yes, it's possible to build it there. And because they say for the many, many puzzles, some of them will be built, some are not. But the in zero puzzle, basically, it's a zero or one process in the build because it's a more close and uh, randomness. So it could be built or not. But in a broad level, this is uh, maybe 40% or 80% is built. So. Uh, so the question is, uh, uh, so Andy, um, you mentioned Vision Tomorrow. Yes. Yeah. So can you say something about the effort involved in that learning and whether or not you need to have any ideas about the need to see um, around to, to use? Yeah, that's a good question because in 2013 we used the manual annotation process plus the ET plus information. Um, we got the, the region got the money from HUD for the sustainability community project about one to two million. So we kind of have the opportunity. They want to use the ET plus to do their work. So we have the opportunity to use the tool they develop for our RTP process. And I think the region want to keep the ET plus for a while, but I think in future, uh, in uh, like 2015, we can even integrate with our opus. For example, we can use the opus to do the forecasting, but we still can use the ET plus to do the evaluation. On the travel model side, um, it's, you're going to the currently still with the four step. Are you planning on going to ABM? What's what's the story on that? Uh, we yeah in our office we talk about a lot of uh, this possibility because we we saw that a lot of big MPOs are working on the ABM, and I think it went well. But I think within four years we may do some research exploration on the ABM because. Um, a lot of time, some of the IBM concept can be implemented in the current four steps and schedule, I uh, mean the structure. But we can we may not work from the IBM within four years. We will after maybe four years <coughs> start. So, thank you. One thing I was, when we went through the process, one thing I was struck by is when we were doing kind of vision based forecasting, there was never questions about uh, validation, about assessing the predictability of those methods. And then when we proposed to use a model, it was, was it calibrated, is it validated, has it demonstrated its predictability? And and it was just, it was striking to me, because it's like, yes, I, I would hope it is, but you realize that's a much different standard than you're holding this other approach to. When you guys have kind of gone back and forth, or at least discussed different methodologies, have you discussed the different standards of predictability that you hold the two approaches to? When they talk about doing manual allocation, do we talk about, okay, well, how well have our manual allocations performed in the past? As opposed to where we say, oh, we're going to use a model. And the first question is, well, has it produced, has it proven that it's been able to be predicted? Yeah, and, and the two questions here, I think the first one is uh, how about the models of predictive. Predictive. So uh, I think we will plan to do some um, back test. I think that work can help uh, that modeling results. But we also think that the feature process is uh, important because basically they kind of do workshop or whatever they want, the people, or leadership and the, the people want, what they want will be included in the, uh, in the vision and results. But the model is more like say, okay, if these are the policies which will be implemented, what kind of output will be? 
So I think the concept are different, different, but as the other regions, same way have the problem about how to compromise the concept between the regional results and the other results. But I think we can use the latest model to try to understand the visual output. Thank you, Andy. Kendra, I guess you're up next. Good morning. My name is Kendra Watkins. Um, I'm with Mr. Cog. We call it Mr. Cog. I think back in 2006, our executive director got a little uh, acronym envy, I think, from Dr. Cog and wanted something catchy. So, so we got we got Mr. Cog, and I'm here with my colleague Sheree Day. And Sheree Day actually taught the Tanzanian, so I started when I was ten. So just to let you guys know that I'm not honest. So we work in partnership uh, with Danielle Jimenez back there uh, on our land use modeling project, and we all work on it probably half time. So just to give you a little context about our region, um, we are uh, we encompass about four counties in central New Mexico. We have a little bit of southern Santa Fe County as well. Uh, two urbanized areas in 2010. Um, the census defined Los Lunas as an urbanized area. They opted into our MPO, so now we cover two urbanized areas. We have about 19 incorporated places, 13 Indian Pueblos or tribal lands, uh, 900,000 people and about 400,000 jobs. We are the employment hub for the state of New Mexico. Almost one out of every two jobs within the state is within our four county area. And we're also um, close to the population hub. Um, this is a picture of growth between 2000 and 2010. So the purple areas, you'll see that a lot of rural New Mexico is actually declining in population. Where that central area there again, uh, about 43% of the population, most of our growth is occurring in urban areas, which I think is a common theme across the country. Our forecast is pretty significant. Like Salt Lake, we're about at 53% out 30, uh, 25 years. So right now we're 890 were projected to grow by about 470,000 to total 1.36 million in 2040. During our metropolitan tran uh, transportation planning process, we came out with a 2035 socioeconomic forecast. And this map series was pretty powerful for public involvement in board meetings because we showed that under current plans and policies, we're actually projecting to grow by about 100,000 acres. So we see a lot of land consumption, particularly west of the Rio Grande. So you see that, I don't know if you can see the river right straight through the middle of Albuquerque. Uh, but we know that we're uh, projected the available land and current plans and policies. We're going to allow some significant development on the west side. This is a map of popula population density in 2035. Currently, we have about 37% of the population lives west of the river. Our 2035 projection showed about 50% of the population west of the river. But at the same time, our employment centers continue to be east of the river. So by 2035, still 80% of our jobs east of the river. So as you can imagine, with seven river crossings going through the center of Albuquerque, uh, we've, got, we've got some uh, challenges ahead of us. And this map, really, if, if we thought the other one was a wake-up call, was definitely like, wow. Um, after $3 billion worth of investment and 600 new lane miles, we were still going to see a whole bunch of congestion, uh, particularly on the west side, particularly on those new links or the new infrastructure that was to be added in our Metropolitan Transportation Plan. So there was a general acceptance. Uh, we really conveyed the message, this transportation planning process, that there is no way to build our way out. There aren't enough lane miles across the river, that we really need to start being strategic about different topics, uh, particularly focusing on transit. And we have three ongoing bus rapid transit studies right now 
throughout um, the region. And our board actually set a very aggressive mode share goal for across the river, trips across the river. Right now, we've got about 1.7% of our trips are made by transit, and they want to see 10% by 2025. And they've actually backed that up with funding. So starting in 2016, 25 percent of our discretionary transportation funds are going to be allocated towards transit projects, which is pretty pretty impressive, I think, and we were all impressed as a staff. Um, also, we're talking a lot about maximizing land use and integrating land use and transportation. Of course, we've been talking about that for decades, but um, you know, we're really starting to work closer with the land use planners to help, through scenario analysis, look at how we can better maximize land use. So just to give you a broad picture of our modeling framework, and this is our past modeling framework, and we really see that it's not going to change too much, I think, with our new processes uh, and integration into urban sim. We start with um, population control totals that are developed by our state demographer out of the university, and we come up with long-range employment uh, control totals with the REMI model. Then we do a lot of data collection effort, and this last time took us probably a year to two years, uh, collecting existing land use, what we know about future development, and we got that through interviews with planners and developers and also our local development review process, and then collecting everything we could from sector development plans, area plans, and putting that into a spatial layer that we then fed into our land use model. Uh, what will be different this time is uh, our land use model would then put something out, we do some, some refinements, we bring it back to the public, we'd alter it, and then we put it in the travel demand model. This time we're hoping to have that iterative process every five years so that we can feed our uh, travel skims back into the land use model so we can have that uh, really an integrated process between land use and transportation modeling. Uh, by the way, we run Q, which is a four-step model, and we have no plans to go to AVM anytime soon. <laughs> So oh, this is where I come from. I, I have a confession, people. Last year, after I saw all those wonderful presentations. Oh, yes. Is that better now? Oh, I can hear So yesterday, after I saw all these wonderful presentations, I panicked. I told Kendra, we, we should forego up this little presentation about our previous land use, because who really wants to hear that? It's really boring, Tom can see me. She wasn't having it. So here we go, folks. We're in it together. So <laughs> I'm going to try to make it as fast, as painless as possible. So we developed our land use model, the previous one, or I'm going to call it existing one because we haven't fully developed urban In 1996, Planning Technologies um, developed the model for us. and. They were the one who developed the um, first land use model for Mac. So through this uh, effort, we um, um, collaborated with Matt, which we, we are very grateful for Anibal and his crew. They've been very gracious to us, helping us, uh, lending helping hand with us. Uh, it generates socioeconomic data for our travel demand model. It runs an arc view, outdated model. This, this was probably one of the primary factors that prompted us to go to Urban Sim. It's, it's no longer, so it hasn't been supported in a few years. So potential to develop alternative land use scenarios for development of our long-range transportation plan. Also, it allocates growth from regional and sub-regional um, totals to small geography, which is our data analysis subzone. This is the zones that we create socioeconomic forecast to input for the um, travel demand model. The allocation model uses a district, um, discrete choice model which computes probability or suitability of land to grow, to develop. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit more. So this is a screenshot of um, LAM. It's, we call it land use allocation model, um, LAM. So the top layer is all of our input layer. And the input layer is in the form of uh, polygon shape files. Existing land use has is a um, land use polygon, about 30,000 land use polygons in our 2008 data set. So with existing uh, employment and um, housing densities and classification of the 19 land use classification, plan is long-term plan from master plans and so on and so forth. This is where the uh, policies uh, regarding zoning and maximum densities come into play. Known layer, Kendra talked about it. Um, this is the layer, the development 
is in the pipeline. We know what's going to happen in near future, so we have a good handle of the known layer. An undevelopable layer, that's the constraint layer. Wherever there is an undevelopable layer, we cannot develop land. Whether it's reservation land, we have a huge um, areas of reservation land. Whether it could be a um, slope that uh, prohibits us from development, that is reflected in that um, layer. Kika talked about similarities of the input to land to OPEs. Existing land use is now in the form of a parcel. We went from 30,000 land use polygons to over 600,000 parcels with very detailed information attached to it. Plan layer is going to be in the form of zoning. Known layer is going to be in the form of, in the form of um, uh, project development project um, event. And we're going to use Urban Canvas, where Connor talked about it yesterday. It's going to give us a wonderful platform to input our known layer or development event projects very easily. And undevelopable layer is also reflected as input as percentage of land that can be is allowed to be developed. The second um, row, all those layers are combined and converted to um, grid cells. The reason we chose grid cell is because we had issue with slivers when we combine those layers. So the layers are combined and eligible sites are um, selected in the second row. The third row, we have scoring layers. I'm going to talk about it in the following slide. Scoring layer, what it does, it scores potential sites for development and scores them uh, according to some uh, parameters. Regional forecast come in, forecast gets executed from the base year to forecast year in five year intervals. So what we end up having is we end up having five year increment of forecast layer and socioeconomic data set at um, DSC level. So have to so how do we build land? What happens in this slide is we select sites from land, existing land use by selecting vacant or redevelopable land. Those are the sites that are eligible to get built. From the plan layer, we select conforming land use that we are trying to develop. So that becomes our eligible land. In this slide, these are the scoring layers. What are scoring layers? Scoring layers are independent variables that are statistically proven to be significant in developing that particular land use. They come into play in the short shape of polygon shape files converted to grid cell size. For example, in this example, we have proximity to highway, so cells that are closer to freeway score higher. Infrastructure availability, the same thing happens here. Job access. These layers are combined through equations that we develop through regression analysis to come up with a composite site suitability. That is the layer that actually helps us help the model develop the sites. So this is an example of a composite scoring layer. As you can see, it says the scoring layer for industrial allocation. Through regression model, we determined that four variables are very significant in developing industrial land use, access to principal arterial, freeway, railroad, and also separation from residential area. You don't want your residents to live next to a um, industrial land. This is where allocation happens. The eligible sites are overlaid by um, the layer that we just created, which has the site suitability. And the cells that get the highest scores, all the cells that have the highest probability of allocation for growth. And in this layer, growth happens. Forecast layer is um, produced with, as well as socioeconomic data set by DSC level. And that's it. I'm going to turn it back to Kendra. That was fast, wasn't it? It was just gripping. It was gripping. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so essentially, Sheree kind of uh, talked a little bit about our old land use model. We've moved to, uh, or we're in the process of moving to a new land use model for several reasons. One, the outdated platform, but two, um, the inputs were already there um, in terms of the way we used to think about land use modeling. It's very an intuitive framework for us. 
Um, and it satisfies a lot of our needs. First of all, our work plan, we need to come out, obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, with a long-range forecast. And we also wanted to be able to do alternative scenario analysis. Also, it satisfied the needs of the transportation staff when we met and talked about it. They wanted to be able to look at a fine geography. They wanted to be able to analyze transit-oriented development and also uh, look at policy change and work with the land use planners in that manner. And then last of all, for the modelers, it helped us to integrate the travel model a little closer than we have been in the past. And those estimations being internal to the model is really a huge bonus. Um, Sheree alluded to it, just our arduous process of doing these regression analyses. So having that internal to the model and then being able to work with it that way was going to um, really be improvement for us. And lastly, um, <clears throat> we have this known development. We wanted to be able to incorporate that. So when people saw our forecast, it made sense with what they knew was happening. So this ability to import scheduled development events is a really big deal for us as well. And lastly, of course, is the well-established user community. Andy alluded to it, too. I mean, just having the urbansim.org, the website, the collaboration, uh, and the vendor support, of course, because we knew we were going to need some help in getting this off the ground. So we contracted with Synthicity back in November of 2012. Essentially, um, three items. We wanted to develop an urban sim model uh, so that we could have parcel level detail, but also be able to use, have it be flexible enough for those aggregations, such as the zonal geography. Uh, one big thing we've heard over and over again, we talked with a lot of MPOs, thank you, Anna Bob, and several others of you out there, um, and the data, the data, the data, don't spend too much time on the data, don't get caught up in the data, but you're going to have problems with the data. Um, so we uh, really wanted to uh, see if we could automate some of the corrections, be able to um, look at what was extraneous values or missing values and do that uh, sort of imputation on the fly um, and then really be able to get in and have something to work off of. So we wanted an automated process that was repeatable and documented. And then lastly, uh, we really liked the urban canvas um, framework and it was also something that our stakeholders really wanted to see. So, uh, so as far as that second point there, that automated process, so I know we weren't asking for anything small. We basically wanted to take multiple data sets and assemble them together. We wanted to clean and complete them. We wanted an autonomous process so then we could then do it in-house, especially when we have data updates. We wanted that process to be documented. So in short, a consistent, transparent, and repeatable modeling workflow for select processes. So, you know, we, we're very impressed and um, and so happy with, with having uh, Eddie and Connor and, and, and your team at Synthicity to help us with this. So one of the big things that they did was they um, first unioned multiple data sources. We have um, four databases from the assessors and they all have different shortcomings. One's pretty complete, one's completely holy, and then everything in between. So they took all those and kind of put them together and um, also unioned those with what we knew about existing land use both from comprehensive plans and also from our um, base data set that we had from our previous land use model. And then on top of that overlaid development constraints, which were applied I think as a ratio by parcel about what, how much of each parcel is developable versus undevelopable. And then, um, and then they got started with the residential imputations. We provided multiple data sources that would help with that process. We had a multi, uh, metro study database, residential building permits, and American Community Survey data, which was used to provide data, but also to standardize some of the values. And then, of course, we wanted to flag the imputed records so we could go back and look at them and see what happened. And then with non-residential, same thing. We had multiple data sources. Those are all kind of used together in order to impute and synthesize data, and then to flag those cells so that we could look at those as well. And then lastly, just to make sure that we could um, match some sort of reasonability because we don't know how far off our assessor data is at this point, we had zonal control totals. So we wanted to stay true to the 2010 census counts um, of housing and then also estimates at the zonal level of employment that we knew were good. So uh, this nice little GUI was developed. Uh, so that we've got this list of processes, list of scripts, we can check them as we go. So as we get new data, as we develop new zonal totals, uh, we can put them in the proper place, check the box, and rerun them uh, seamlessly. Uh, lastly, Urban Canvas, um, just real quick on that because you saw a lot on it yesterday, but we thought it was two, um, had two really important purposes. One for the modeler or for us as staff 
it was a good way to review, evaluate, and um, be able to detect errors in our base data, enter the scheduled development events through the development editor, and then also visualize simulations on the fly, which you saw yesterday from Eddie. Um, so we're really excited about that. But also for our stakeholders, again, so that we could get valuable input from them and also be able to um, present our simulations in a way that they could understand. So where are we right now? Some key milestones that we've passed. Um, we did a lot of testing with a mock data set. We've done a lot of data collection, and I wouldn't minimize the amount of time it takes to uh, collect that assessor data. Uh, we've um, actually got PopGen up and running. Thank you to, um, to, to Mag Staff and Han Yi, who helped us with that. Uh, we have uh, the imputation and synthesis done already, um, and, and so now it's just a, a process of refinement. We've got two deliveries of urban sim draft models and a delivery of urban canvas and some preliminary estimations. So upcoming, we know we have a lot of work to do. Uh, we're about to receive, I think, a new delivery of urban canvas so we can really dive into the data and start looking. I know, uh, you know, I know yeah, some of you are smiling. I know it's going to be a lot of work. Um, and then we've also got to deliver some other tables. The zoning table is a big deal, and we're almost completed with that. We're going to refine our estimations through an iterative process with Eddie and integrate our travel demand model. And then, of course, we've got validation, calibration, and documentation ahead of us. Thank you. Before I open up the questions, uh, thanks for, for adding in that stuff about the slides. I can see your face that yeah, is a lot so those, those slides, you still use them. And it's, it's been very interesting working with so our model system, the quantum system, is called SAP. It's not the only allegation model, and then we had SAP. And the idea was, <laughs> and the idea was, land and SAP grew up together because of the same consulting that they Interesting. We're kind of in the same boat again. It's, um, we started with urban sim, and now you guys are moving into synthesity, and so we're looking to you, and then we're like, okay, we'll jump into that next. So it's just been interesting, this back and forth. And it's events like this that has helped us build this informal dog and deal group and background that we can share and share experiences. And we don't have to solve all these So this has been great. Thank you. Uh, question for today. <laughs> I do have one. What's your, your adoption forecast? What's your approval process when you forecast? You produce something, your stakeholder, and what do you produce at the end? Uh, we have a tremendous amount of input that goes into our socioeconomic creation, but as far as the adoption, it's adopted along with our long range transportation plan. So there's a presentation to our board both on the transportation side and on the socioeconomic side, and then it's approved. Yeah, yes, that's right. No, um, they actually were really, really in sync with our adoption process. Uh, not in sync, bad timing, but every four years. So for our 2035 MTP, we based those on, and we talked about this a little bit, a forecast that came out in 2008. How, how many folks have seen a tremendous decrease in your forecast recently? Yeah. Yeah. So so we experienced the same thing, and, and so we just uh, got new new projections from the state demographer that we'll then put into the 2040. Um, this almost tagged on the idea of Thank you. 
Yeah, I think that's a great question, and I definitely would open it up because we're about to get there, um, or we're not quite yet there, but. Right, definitely. Um, yeah, I think with the with the great tool, we have a larger responsibility to provide better uh, analysis, and particularly as it relates to policy development. And so I think that that's happening now um, with this land use transportation integration group. Um, there's a lot of interest in the models, which is good. And so, um, you know, I, th I think through this, this group and that we have people um, that are involved in the process and, um, and, and also have the ear of the agencies that they work for. Um, hopefully, through Urban Canvas, we'll be able to, well, not only through Urban Canvas, but also the ability to generate meaningful indicators. Uh, or performance measures, we'll be able to have a little bit more of a robust dialogue than we've had in the past. And that's really tied into our scenario analysis process. And so we're about to go out now to more public meetings and talk about performance measures and talk about what people want to see. Yeah. <laughs> That's helpful. Yeah, because I think we do have the year. I mean, I think I can see presentations to city council. There's a lot of ideas floating, but um, there really seems to be people stick on to the numbers. So, so that'll be. <laughs> Right. Right. Oh. Any other questions? Uh, 1.7. Yeah. Um, yes, yes. Um, BRT, and really um, that number was just pulled out of the air, um, to be honest with you. But I think it just gave the boards a, a goal. Um, we do have a lot of um, energy be be between developing, behind developing transit systems, and we don't have bus rapid transit right now, but um, our major corridors, 
are all talking about it and looking at it and actually have uh, money behind it. So, so there will be a greater mode share, but I can't say that it will be 10%. So as the major corridors are talking about it, are you seeing the land use plans come up with a different version? Yeah. They're kind of saying, okay, they'll have to do everything else. Yes. Plan on. Yeah. How does that compare to the market reality? Interestingly enough, we have a real opportunity in our region right now. Um, be behind this transit-oriented or these, these transit studies, we have a lot of developer participation. And I think uh, the development community is really supportive behind it and, um, and talking about land use. And we're really getting into the conversations of how do you make a deal? Like, what, what do I need in place to make this development that you want to see work? And so there's something that I haven't, I mean, I've been there 11 years, I haven't seen this yet. And so we've got a lot of participation between the, the business community, the planners, and transportation. Uh, we need to bring some engineers on board. Um, I think we're getting a little bit stuck, you know, with this, well, do we need a three lane or a five lane? And your numbers say we need a five lane uh, rather than three lane and added transit capacity. So, so we need to be able to, um, I think, uh, you know, have a more robust conversation with, with that community. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, Mark Simons and PSRC, and of course, Billy, please jump in uh, like yesterday when you've got the important uh, thoughts, observations. Bear with me while the coffee slowly starts to replace the Tricera Hops Ale that's still in my bloodstream from last night. Um, here's what I'm going to attempt to walk through this morning. Um, I'm going to talk more on the technical side of things today and talk about some of the different uh, We'll call them innovations, we'll call them tests that we put into our last effort of getting urban sim and the forecasts out the door. So first, I'm going to try to walk through the uncertainty and confidence interval treatment that Hana came up with. And it's going to be a very high level summary and a look at what the final product looks like. But if you ask me to explain Bayesian melding, I'm probably going to explain it the same way that I would uh, what I know about how an airplane flies, right? There's a pilot in the front and they push a button and they pull back on the wheel and the plane goes up. That's about the level of detail, but Hana, of course, is a resource who will work with you if you are interested in this and uh, talk you through the steps in more detail. The restructuring of the developer model, I'm going to just go through a little bit of kind of the issues that we ran into and some of the things that we tried to work around some of the observations that we had in the data. And uh, I think the best way to characterize this is I'm hoping that perhaps someone out here will go, what? And say, why didn't you try this? Or I will find out later that the pro forma model takes care of all these issues for me. Um, I think that our objective here is to put this out for discussion and hear more. I don't think any of these are set in stone uh, changes that we want to maintain going forward. They were incremental steps to address issues. And then I'll talk a little bit about just what we're working on now with the activity-based model integration and some new work that's coming out, including some new urban sim models that Hana in particular is working on. The disclaimer at the bottom uh, refers to the fact that uh, I am the spokesperson for the brain power that you'll see behind in some of these slides. Uh, one of them is in Ireland, Hana, on sabbatical right now uh, with her husband. The best part about having someone in an eight-hour time zone difference working for you is it's magic because you have a problem at the end of the day and you send it by email and say, Hana, can you help? And you come in in the morning and it's, and it's solved. So it's like a, a time warp or something. Uh, Mike Jensen, I will acknowledge his contributions. He's on vacation this week hiking around Mount Rainier. Matthew Kitchen, who formerly was a program manager in DSA, also contributed heavily to a lot of this content. He's uh, now a consultant for Eco Northwest, and so that's where he goes to now. So if you wonder what that clause is, I might play it here for some very tough questions. 
the uncertainty portion of the program came from uh, factors that you're all familiar with. Uh, uncertainty in models and in forecasts can become or can be caused by parameters. You can have errors in your input data model structure. We could probably list several other uh, uh, causes. However, we usually report the output as point predictions. And so uh, Hannah worked on uh, several papers, um, I think 2007 and 2009, uh, 2011, excuse me, um, about how to use Bayesian statistical techniques and apply them to models and measure uncertainty and try to account for it. And a walkthrough of those basic steps is here. Uh, basically, you use the validation exercise to come up with this variance. You observe um, the simulated data, compare it to the actual estimates that you've come up with as some sort of a geography. In our case, it was a forecast analysis. So, uh, there's regions carved into 219 of those, just for perspective. And so, in addition to that process, when you use that validation result, and essentially it's a combination of the statistical techniques that HANA has come up with in concert with the other uh, collaborators listed here in the papers, um, and you basically take that, that result, that variation, and you feed it back, so to speak, is the way I think about it. You look at it in terms of that variance could in, uh, inform you about how accurate your parameters were in the first place that came up with that output. So it's a way of taking the validation results, if I can you know, uh, try to simplify this, and take it back onto the inputs that you're using and use that then to come up with a variation of what your output would be. What is the right combination of parameter adjustments, so to speak, that would produce that output that you should have gotten from your validation period? So that uh, variance, so to speak, is propagated forward using several other points in time. So compare 2006 and 2008 in the output. And in the end, we get this confidence interval on our final 2040 output. And so a way of saying basically we believe that based on our model structure, the confidence that we have in it, the, the, the uh, amount of uh, uh, effort we put into getting everything right, so to speak, with this forecast, we believe that that range we're giving you, there's a 1 in 10 chance that the actual forecast value would fall below that confidence interval, a 1 in 10 chance that it would fall above that. So how this uh, worked itself into our final forecast product is that we have this validation memo, and we report out, in this instance now, we have rolled the phases up to the phase large area, which we have about 18 of those in the region. And we came up with a 2000 and a 2040 points that we would place, and then we would plot the confidence interval around it. And we've been um, highlighting this, I think, as we uh, rolled the forecasts out as a way of measuring that uncertainty and making sure that that's kind of aware in people's minds as they're working with the forecasts. The other thing that we used it for, I kind of alluded to yesterday, and that's the uh, adjustment process that we had to work through at the end of the modeling work and trying to convert from output to forecasts. So trying to take into account things within the model system that we couldn't quite get right with this initial application and yet still produce reasonable forecasts, accounting for comments that we received back. So in this instance, um, you know, the City of Kirkland staff came through and highlighted for us several areas where they believe the model wasn't redeveloping what they felt would redevelop. Um, they cited several different studies they had in terms of their buildable lands capacity analysis that they did. And in the end, they made a case that we could adjust upwards um, that forecast that we had, something more consistent with what they had previously in their last forecast for this particular zone. So our compromise solution then was to go ahead and make that adjustment and to keep it within that confidence interval so we weren't necessarily uh, rejecting kind of the findings of our model. It's a way to kind of tie all that together, at least in this initial application. I think, you know, we all just kind of reached a consensus that it was an important thing to start considering in our forecast product. A word on the refinement, too, that uh, I didn't cover yesterday, and that's that we kept it at a zero-sum game, so to speak. So when we went through this process, if I'm adding 1,000 households to Kirkland, I'm not modifying the regional forecast, I'm coming up with distributions from other places. So it's a, a way that we try to keep uh, consistent with our regional forecast and basically kind of acknowledge that we may, through some thing that we haven't captured correctly in this formulation of urban sim, not gotten the allocation right. So uh, an adjustment to the allocation results, so to speak. 
So um, with the developer model, um, the issues that we encountered were several as we kind of worked through this. And it was a, a function of things that we were working on prior to getting the consensus with our LUTAC, if you recall from yesterday, that we were going to go ahead and shift from uh, research development mode to production mode. And it was things that came out during the review process, things that we hadn't noticed before when jurisdictions and other reviewers would be checking the boxes saying, what's going on here? We would dig in and find out. So I've only highlighted three, uh, three or four big things that we tried to take on. And in order here, I've got um, the, the intersection of the, con uh, the development constraints that we had with the templates and the number of proposals this was generating. So I think we probably went overkill in the end, and to make sure that proposals were being generated on every parcel, we've had some parcels that had very wide range of allowable constraints, anywhere from, say, 4 to 50 dwelling units per acre in one instance um, that we were assured was, was accurate. Um, but then by the time you take all of the templates and collide it, you were generating a, a large, large number of proposals for a single parcel which we felt might introduce some bias to that whole selection process if that particular parcel was overrepresented. Um, the interpretation of demand in the development of mixed-use parcels was also something that we, we came across. So modeling during a recession and the fact that the job growth was very stagnant, we found that those first 10 to 15 years in our simulation did not have a lot of overall demand for non-residential space to be added. We didn't have much job growth or we had job loss that was leaving vacancy behind. So <clears throat> we would go through stretches of the model where using that hard vacancy rate as a trigger, so to speak, an in interpretation of demand, we would not have a vacancy rate dropping below our target value that would trigger that additional commercial space in, in the tradi uh, traditional structure of the parcel model. Um, and then we uh, went around on how to come up with the return on investment or the proper weighting, the proper financial weighting to attach to these proposals. Um, a lot of our cost information, I think we, uh, we didn't spend a lot of time researching that and structuring that into the templates. And so sometimes we would have negative ROIs. And granted, this is just a weight that you're putting on to proposals, but it's still something that we thought open the question up is, are we sending the right price signals here when we're selecting these, these proposals? Um, and so again, just stressing, these were things that we tried and I think you know, we'd really like to see if we can remove an interim tag from them and come up with better solutions going forward. I thought it was worth potentially putting this out here and seeing what kind of comments we get back. So one early structure modification we did was the developer model. And we separated this out into two different competition round, so to speak. We did a clearing first on the parcel level, and then whoever graduated or won from the parcel level competition in terms of proposals would enter the regional level. So this was an attempt to kind of recognize the fact that we might be generating uh, excessive proposals in some of these parcels and to try to take care of that before we went into the selection process. So uh, this was a, uh, a response to the um, the uneven demand that we were sometimes getting with our regional forecasts and the fact that on mixed use, if we went through a 10 or 15 year period where there wasn't a demand being recognized for commercial space, a lot of the land that could go both ways was only able to, in our model structure at the time, choose what it had the demand for. In this case, it would have been multifamily. So in some of our CBDs, we were sort of using up our land supply early on in the simulation with multifamily, which maybe isn't you know, necessarily unrealistic, but in the end, uh, sometimes we'd have that you know, kind of exceed what you would expect from a normal, uh, looking at what type of mixed-use distribution between residential and non-residential is expected, the comments we were getting back. So we put something in there that was kind of a, a joint demand check, is how I termed it here, which said that on a multifamily parcel, or excuse me, a mixed-use parcel, we had to see demand for more than just one type of use before that proposal would be considered any further. So multifamily condo, for example, here I'm showing that in this particular example, our, our vacancy rate table here down on the, the right, lower right, showing the current vacancy rates and then the target, and any time that fell below that in our version of the model, that's interpreted as demand for that space exists for that particular development here. And so since this particular parcel generates proposals for multifamily, commercial, office, and mixed, 
it would need to see demand in those uses before it would consider anything further. If one of those wasn't in demand, it would have kept it from building out in that particular year. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think that kind of sums up that particular um, uh, mechanical uh, thing that we tried. The proposal competition here with the valuation filtering, too, is another step that we put in. So um, Mike Jensen was able to secure for us a, an extract from a commercial brokers association data set. And I'm not sure who he talked to or how he got it. But based on that, we had some information on sales and leases um, on commercial properties and in um, uh, condominium multifamily properties as well. So something beyond the assessor's valuation and the assessor's sale extracts that we had. So we he did some comparison work and found that that looked like it did a better job of representing uh, purchase prices and other economic valuation on these new uh, developments. We used that then to estimate our expected sales price model. And it's a component model in the sense of the, uh, at some point broke it down to in a split use building, a mixed use building. It would estimate the retail or the you know, office and then the res residential component separately and merge them back together. Um, we basically then, at this point, would uh, take the proposals and we would expand them out to total price. We would compare those valuations and we would drop proposals that didn't come within a certain spitting distance of the maximum valuation on there. So in this particular example, the highest one generated a 1.5 million sales price in our model. Everything that didn't come within 65% of that was dropped for further consideration. We would advance a maximum of 10 proposals per parcel into that regional pool. Um, the developer model here as well, now I mentioned earlier that we struggled with getting the cost and price stuff um, right in our minds, and so in the end what we actually did was take an assumed profit margin. And so one of the arguments we heard was that developers and land sellers these days are fairly educated about what you can do on a particular proposal or on a particular piece of land, and so the profit margins wouldn't vary that much. It's like a lot of those costs and development things are factored into the asking price. And so the idea that there's some kind of a convergence on profits that developers get is kind of advanced, and at some point we decided to try this and we put it in, essentially replacing the ROI as a weight using a, um, an exponentiated factor of 9% of the expected sales price, essentially, as the price signal that we used. So that's just kind of the walkthrough of some of the things that we uh, experimented with, and again, just emphasizing the interim tag and the fact that, you know, I think that as we retrench now and go back and reevaluate, figure out what our model improvement program looks like over the next year or two, you know, reevaluating everything that we did was on the list and especially finding out about the new tools and techniques that, that are out there. Uh, I've mentioned the Proforma model in particular. Um, a final word then on the AB model um, side of things, and um, really have I Soundcast, correct? Okay, so we're implementing Soundcast, uh, our activity-based model. It's descended from DaySim. It's the contract that we're, uh, we're currently working on, and it's, um, uh, in-house, the urban sim side of things that we are responsible for is coming up with that data interchange design uh, between urban sim and Soundcast. So that's something that's going to be a point of emphasis for the next couple of years. Um, and along with that, we are putting some work into some new models in urban sim. Uh, this is a, a diagram uh, based on work that Hana is doing again on the school location models. And so she's actually coming up then with ways to assign these students to the school locations that we're representing based on different techniques. We've got some choice models in sequence. We've got a, a very simple capacity-based assignment right now for the college side that we're working on improving. Um, but just a, a preliminary prototype of the model that we hope to develop along with some other things that I probably am not even in yet in the loop on but that will emerge. So um, that's my summary of some of the more technical, uh, detailed things that we've been working on or will be working on. I've listed out, uh, I think, everyone that I could think of that's involved now in Billy's modeling world at PSRC um, to give them some acknowledgement. And that's what I thought. I'll take any questions you got, take a stab at them.
It's uh, uh, essentially the way that the new building stock is added to the model. So uh, I'm referring to the developer model sequence of things and uh, the representation of what happens in the land markets. So uh, by proposal competition, it's essentially the, the proxy for how uh, developers and people selling the land get together and make that transaction and then figure out what makes the best economic sense given the constraints that you've got. So the way we've represented that in this particular model is to generate these proposals uh, off of the parcels, and then those go in, and you've got virtual developers basically selecting those proposals based on the demand and the price signals that we send it. So, I find your uncertainty analysis interesting. You say you use a Bayesian approach, then you report a confidence interval, which is essentially a frequent interpretation. And why not just report on a PDF for your variables and let it get down? Hey, what? You're reporting. This one might be that airplane example, unless I can refer to one of the other co authors of those papers. Um, yeah, how does that play out in our current formulation? Um, yeah. Um, I think that this is going to uh, try a multi part answer that dates back to also how we set up the 2000 base here that we were using. Um, in the instances where we had pretty clean matchups between our QCEW records and our assessor's files, uh, we would essentially stick with that, so to speak. We would do a reasonableness check on the square feet that we were putting in there, the jobs that were being assigned. And then we would usually put an assumed vacancy rate attached to it. And um, I am blanking on whether or not we had anything that was varied by subregion or building type, or if we used a standard assumption. But there was an idea of essentially in, in our, our uh, work, uh, the building converts itself to cubicles, so to speak. And so there's a certain amount of empty cubicles that exist. And um, when we go through the process of modeling in those first 10 years in particular, when we were doing our validation period, the jobs decreasing, there's a random selection of those jobs that disappear to make your control totals match up. So if it shows a manufacturing decrease of 10,000 jobs, those would be randomly removed. Those would leave the spaces behind. And so that gets factored into your vacancy rate calculation. Then and the model sees those empty units and takes that into consideration before it decides if there's demand for additional space. So mechanically, it's represented. There's probably some things that we could do to, to tighten that up because um, it's probably not as absolute. There's usually demand for new, we saw demand for new space even during recession in the sense that we saw new buildings being built. So uh, there's different factors that contribute to that that we're def you know, definitely not representing probably robustly at the moment. And, yeah. Sure. Yes. 
Yeah, good question. Um, we did actually go back and do some additional research on the cost factors, um, and we could have done a lot more. It was a very light check at the time, and I think this is a, a switch kind of to a, a procedure uh, comment. I think this is one of the, the drawbacks of where we were with this sprint to the finish incremental approach in that we would look at that, we would say, does it look good enough? And yeah, how much more time would we have to spend to really research this? Or are there some other alternatives? So I think we could have continued to work and refine that and probably addressed it. It was an open-ended question to us as how much time that might take. And I think we essentially branched off and tried something different at that point. So I think we had windowed it down with some changes that we made from an early version of the model that we were running. Um, but we never completely eradicated it, to my knowledge. Question on your population and your sensitizer. Are you sampling like from a, uh, like homes or something like that for your population then? Or are you using people? Yeah. Um, this was. Uh, dated work. We have not updated that for some time. Um, we used a population synthesizer, I believe, for PopGen, um, and it was something that was drawn on work uh, from ARC, um, Atlanta Regional. Um, and uh, trying to give proper credit to the developers of it, uh, the only one I can think of right now is John Bowman. And um, it did use PUMS records uh, along with the different marginal control totals. So it, I believe it operated similarly to you know, current incarnations of a, of a population synthesizer. But it did clone PUM records. Are there any deaths and uh, pretty serious doubts about that? Right now it's in the game of town, but uh, there's several things. For one, a lot of the PUMS data are computed, and it's just an optic incubation, and uh, that's not the way you do things nowadays. Uh, another problem is uh, it looks like uh, there's a serious movement for the ACS, so that may not be available anymore. Uh, third thing is when you're sampling from your different cells using your control totals, there's a lot of trends that it doesn't pick up. But there's new, I, I compared um, the 90 pounds data set to 2,000 pounds data set for California. It doesn't pick up things like increasing the uh, some households uh, that's going on. So. Uh, good observations, and I, I certainly don't have any alternatives that, that come to mind. There might be some folks here that have done a lot more recent investigation to population synthesizers that might be able to, to share. Thanks again. So, uh, 
I mentioned earlier, we've been in the modeling stuff, we've been doing it on the landing side. Uh, that was one of the biggest things why we decided to go with that and some processes that we still have to do. We felt we had most of the data when we started. And very soon we realized that we did. And that's why we went into a long data set. That was our recommendation to just become technical and move it less heavily directly on the inside and also start to do the model system. And and we'll go through all the details, some of the details here. Um, but what's interesting is a lot of the stuff that Mark talked about is pretty much what we face during our process. Thank you. And uh, we'll be talking during our process, we talk a lot to Swim School, Mark, the School, the um, Little School, talking about what our experiences are, how we solve those problems. So having that network was essential to help us and to go on that. So we're basically planning on talking about a couple of these things and data, data, data is the biggest thing you know, and kind of get end with the next steps. Uh, Jesse, do you want to go with that? <laughs> yeah, so eventually we did have success, but it didn't come without its challenges. And uh, so one of the things that we realized um, just within the past couple of weeks when we're delivering a bunch of data to our transportation folks is just how many data fields that we're, that we're putting out to them and, and how big of a challenge it is just to evaluate all of these fields, whether or not they make any sense. And so for all the transportation input files, you know, we have 3,000 TASs by 41 indicators another file by NAICS, which gives us 78,000 cells that we're delivering. This is all just for a single simulation year. They asked for an auto ownership model file with a whole big cross tab of, of different different cells. They want a MAS-based file now for their AVM, which comes up with another million plus, million and a half cells. And so we're coming up we're by, per simulation year. They also asked for this annually. So it's not just every five years, it's, it's annually. And 2.3 million cells per year you know, when, when, when we're trying to track down issues before we give them this data, it, it's really challenging. It's a big, it's a big deal and, uh, you know, something we're looking for ideas on, I think. Um, you know, for 30 years, it's 70 million data cells. And uh, that's, that's not all that's in the model. Uh, there's, there's more in there that we can pull out. That's just what we're giving to transportation. <clears throat> and, and their needs. So that's, that's why one of the questions I was asking was, at the end, we're producing this for feeding our travel models. And four-step model, we're producing this data set every five year by TAS. Yes, we have 3,000 some TASs or 2,000 TASs. TASs keep, have a tendency to keep multiplying by themselves three ways. So, but now we've created this lovely new geography thanks to Sandak called microanalysis. Our, our travel modeling medium is in line with what Sandak's doing. And again, so we're doing that piece. And their data needs. And the idea is that 70 million cells that we put out, how do we get the warm and fuzzy users? How good is this? And we do keep getting questions on any one of those things. Actually, yesterday there was a fire, and today morning there's another one. And it's like, how, how am I supposed to answer why did this happen at this time? And digging through the models to get to the answer of why is this for this year is not easy. So yesterday's presentation on urban panelists and that visualization is exactly what help us at least see what's happening. But at the end of the day, you cannot really evaluate your results on an annual basis. It's yes, you can look at one year and the second year, but then there's the annual and then the change from one year to the other, and you get questioned on all of that. Because that in the end is impacting the travel models. So moving on from that, just a little bit about data and, and how we kind of set up our data structure and some of the problems that we ran into when we when we did this. Um, I, I think a lot of this stuff, a lot of you folks probably do similar things, but this is kind of how we structure our, our data development process for a base year database when we run our models and what we do with all that data. So, um, you know, we start with a whole variety of, of, of Excel files, shape files, feature classes. There's a whole ton of stuff that go into control totals, things to assemble our built space, all the different geographies that come into this, all come from different sources, as we all know. And, you know, we, we assemble all this into a, a SQL Server database. Our IT folks have, you know, made the investment in the Microsoft SQL Server products, so that's what we're using. 
um, for most of our uh, tabular data. We try to get it all in one place at least. Um, excuse me. And then once we get it all in here, we do you know we do some checking. We try to uh, you know impute values if needed, those sorts of things. Um, and then we go through a synthesis process for population and employment. We just had some comments, of course, about how you know the problems that are inherent in the synthesis of population and uh, and employment too. There's similar issues there. Um, we take all this stuff and we we compile it all into this parcel level SQL database. So at the end of this process, we feel like we have a pretty good handle on uh, the parcel the parcel data set. It you know at the end we feel pretty good about it. We do a lot of analysis on this, and it's really pretty useful in and of itself, not just for modeling. I mean, a lot of we get a lot of uh, use out of this thing. So uh, we have that, and we built this other tool that that takes this data. And I think I described this yesterday. We can aggregate any of this parcel level data to any any zone system that we've we've put on the parcel. So this tool, you know, we used super parcels this last time. Maybe, maybe we will do that again. Maybe we won't. Um, but this tool can help us aggregate to what, whatever it is we need. And from that point forward, we have to cache this into the binary cache. <clears throat> and this isn't a this isn't a big problem. And we do our do our data runs. But after that. And this is something that was really interesting yesterday with the Urban Canvas is that the first thing we've been doing for a long time with the Urban Sim Cache is just immediately uploading it all of it back into SQL Server. Every table, every year, it all just goes right back into SQL Server, and then we use that for analysis. Um, we do. We sometimes do use the Opus uh, Tacoa language for uh, doing indicators, and, and that does help us get at certain things really quickly. Um, but it, we just found it. You know, a good good for backup purposes since we have that SQL Server in place. Um, we just upload it all back there, and of course, then there's sort of a, the spatial side of this. That if we want to map any of this, there's a spatial database somewhere, whether it's a file geo database or SDE or something. And you know, in the end, you know, we have a pretty complex picture here, and it, it's uh, there's a lot of things that, that creep up, and it's tough to figure out where it all came from in the end. And it takes all three, all three or four of us that work there to figure out, you know, what the lineage was of things. So the big question about this ugly thing is, where's the metadata? You know, where, where, where is the uh, the lineage of of what made this certain cache and what changes got made? And especially when we start doing scenarios and things, it's a big problem for us to keep track of. Um, other little things that we ran into when we do employment synthesis, you know. Uh, there's too many employees for the building, or you know thing, things of that nature. Same thing on the population side. The census says there's population there. The assessor says there's no dwelling units. Um, at this process is a pretty linear. So the example here is what if something changes? You know, TAS has changed or something in, in, in the process. We kind of have to go back through all this. The tools are pretty helpful, but if we have changes that are you know late in the game, it can make it pretty challenging to to, to redo this and then track that metadata as to what kind of change did we really make here. You know, the metadata that we have is really table names. You know, table names in our memory that, uh, that keep it together. Um, you know, and, and this, this too, that this process I described of running, running an urban sim simulation, uploading it all back to SQL Server, I mean, that takes, takes a long time. It's a lot of data just to upload. I mean, we're talking several hours of, of just upload time to get it back in there. So it's not, not as rapid as we'd like to see. So we're pretty attracted to some of the things we saw yesterday. Uh, to, to more quickly get at get at those things. So when we started the process, when we started the modeling process in December, we were going to run a projection series for one county. We were one county every year. That's what we were doing. Uh, two thousand some passes. Okay, we've done this before. Well, two months into it, our travel modeler said, "Well, we need two counties. We need to start modeling this other county too." And the council governments there signed an MOU, and we were producing projections for them. So now suddenly this became a two-county model. The data doubled right away. Uh, geographies kept changing, and the data kept changing. So yes, and we'll walk you through the process of how we went through the drafts and everything. But during the drafts, when you start your stakeholder input. That's really when our stakeholders started noticing gaps in the data that they have provided us. Because our deal is, you're saying this area is going to grow faster. Why? What what development project or what's happening here that you can support this for? Why is the model incorrect in this? And why do you think what you're suggesting is correct? Well, yes, we had a development project. But the minute you have that development project, it completely changes everything. Your zone geography, everything else changes. Our super parcels change. 
that process itself, if you super parse those chains, that synthesis has to happen all over again because you're basically redoing all of that. Uh, the other piece, which I think now has solved, is the fact that our caches are extremely large. This back and forth can be SQL, etc. I don't know. At the end of the day, it's about 30, 30 gigs. Probably 30 gigs. 30 per gigs for one model year. And that's without roughly. transportation data. Right. Transportation is another 20, 25 wow. gigs by itself. So, yes, our, our IT folks love us. <laughs> We're just taking space away. And, and this doesn't happen over one run. You're running run after run because you're trying to solve the issues. And that goes back to that metadata. So how do you keep track of what did we change when? So the piece that I heard yesterday is that runs are incremental in terms of you're not caches and getting created every year. That was great. That helps a lot on that side of things. Uh, one of the other pieces on the data, public employment, we found was a big hole in the whole data set in terms of where do you get that data set from on the employment side and on the space side. The assessor doesn't care about that space. Uh, that goes back to school enrollment. We got into the middle of this thing with our travel modelers. We were doing ABM and they were asking for, hey, we need school enrollment. Perfect, we have where the schools are. Well, our employer database did not match with where the school location was, and that doesn't match with enrollment. So good luck with that, trying to figure out. And schools have a tendency to move. Some are down, some open over time, and then, then you start getting into this changes again on that stuff. So there are these minor issues that kept coming up through the whole process. Uh, we have a, another recycled slide here that uh, this is sort of another representation of something I described yesterday of uh, <clears throat> how our model system is set up. Um, you know, we start with the demographic models and regional economic models up top, go to the, which give us county control totals, run a zone-based model system to sub-areas or market areas next, and then we use a, yet another model uh, to get us down to our super parcels. And, and this is something that, that we did this time, and, and we, it worked in the end, um, but it's, it's something that we're going to evaluate on, on how, we can, how we can adjust this. I think we're, we're kind of stuck to the top level of this. Um, with the demographic and regional economic side to the county, but uh, the sub area stuff, while it did work, something I'd personally like to explore is um, the uh, nested logit approach to this that, that might might help us um, eliminate maybe an entire model system out of here if we can do it all in one. So that's really the, why we kind of brought this in was just say that we did this, uh, it did work, uh, it didn't come without its problems as well, um, and. Yeah, this is a similar slide from yesterday. We, one of the big things that I learned out of this, being the first time that I've been through this, is that uh, you know, in the end, I realized that you know, urban sim can maybe only get us so far. Um, and and once we get into these reviews with the, with our, with our stakeholders, um, you know, we may need some some, some different tools. Um, you know, our draft one comments that that we got back, they, they essentially became targets for our second. For our next uh, our next draft, um, which was really challenging, we we delivered them uh, employment by land use, um, but but the model doesn't run with employment by land use. It runs on NAICS type industry sectors. So it, the reason we gave them employment by land use is what we did before, and it's what they were used to. But just translating those comments back into NAICS sectors and trying to hit those as targets in 2020, which is what we delivered in draft one, so they you know saw what they were expecting next draft. Um, that was a big deal. Um, it was it was it was really challenging to get through. Um, in draft two, we really felt like we were you know going under here because it it um, <laughs> again we had these targets to meet and um, it was it was really difficult. The draft two we delivered twenty thirty and forty um, and we we did our best to get it out. We did it, it ended up working. It was just a lot of late nights. Here's, here's where certain other things hit us. Here's, again, as I said, we've done this before. Our stakeholders understand the process. But they've been through a deterministic process before. We've never had a probabilistic model to say things will change. So you send your data out by TAS for review. Stakeholders like some areas, don't like some. They support their changes. Here's why we think to keep that into the model. But nothing stays constant. And that burned us. It's like, Hey, I told you this was good. Why is this declining when I or going up and I told you this is exactly perfect? And you can't hold that. There's yeah, it's tough. there's there's no way to kind of hold that. And that's getting to the point that the nature of the process completely changes the minute your first draft goes out for that review. And that's that was something we learned again. You've got to have something 
after that, then says, okay, now all of these things constant, don't touch this again. I'm very happy with this. Let's rerun something else. This is, that's how the world works. But that's what we started getting the question about. The other piece was, our, we were preparing data sets and running these models to support both a four-step transportation model and an, and an ABM in development. And I'll we'll get a little bit more on that, but that's why we went to this two types of employment type, the land use-based employment, because that's what's feeding the four-step model, and the make space sector that's feeding our truck models and the ABM side of things. And we don't really expect the stakeholders to start evaluating 20 different employment sectors and really long-term projections on employment are any which way very difficult to evaluate and understand. So this was the other piece is how do you kind of communicate that on the employment side of stuff? So yeah, I think I, mean, I think the big takeaway on this slide is you know examine your process if you can try to figure out where where urban stem fits into your existing process with with review and stakeholders and everything else. We found that urban stem was great for us getting up to draft one. Um, we we did use it to get to draft two. It, it got us that far. Um, it was a lot of work to to hit those targets, but in the end, you know, we may need some new set of refined tools to do this. Um, <laughs> It, 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 we're not we're not sure what we need after after this because it's um, because some of our stakeholders like Anna Bob described are really uh, once we give them a number and they like it they, they kind of want us to stick with it and uh, in the end we did have success that's really the, the bottom line I and mean, that's why we put this silly picture in here it's just because it it I mean we, we did it was a lot of work but we did get through this it did give us uh, what we needed um, in the um, end we did go through our committee process we have technical committees and policy committees and the key piece was to keep both of them informed on the committee process informed enough we don't want to overload them with information but keep them informed enough and as part of the process we did end up visiting every stakeholder at least once in the end, and, yeah. uh, and visiting with them sitting with their not just the planning departments but their ed and infrastructure sides too City managers. About, and the city manager sometimes. sometimes to talk about where we are going and how things are. And that's got into that whole thing of how you're pretty much selling the forecast and getting everybody's input and buying into the modeling system itself. So just kind of moving along with the same topic, you know, um, we did a heck of a lot of testing for a few years lead, leading up to our production. And, um, you know, it, it, it's not going to be news to anybody that testing is different from production. And, um, you know some examples of that for us for the demographic evolution models. They were working really well for us in uh, in testing, and when we got down to uh, actually using it in production, it was it was we were finding some some issues in the end that were um, that we needed to address. Same thing for the location choice models. I think we have this on the next slide too. Um, we were kind of new at, at at all this, uh, Honey and I, and and some other folks in our office, and uh, we were we were finding that. Uh, the household location choice models were really attracted to some of our rural areas that had a lot of a lot of capacity um, for, for for building, but um, it, they didn't really make sense to develop in, in, the, in the manner that they did, it, especially so soon. And we didn't. It took us a while of messing around with specifications and reestimating the models over and over and over before we realized that the sampling weights have a big impact on on what gets sampled. And um, hopefully, we haven't done something really wrong here. But for us. The sampling weights, the default one was something like uh, just vacant units, I think, was the sampling weight, and so, or, or vacant developable capacity, I'm sorry, and uh, so it would it would find places that had huge capacity, there were big rural areas, and, and it would choose that pretty often. Um, so we had to adjust the sampling weights a little bit to get a little bit more of what we expected to see. Um, we talked a lot about evolving needs already, I think, about things that came up in the middle of, of our production environment. Um, and another thing at this bottom point, um, you know, our base year was 2010, and uh, our production started in 2012. So we had uh, a couple of years of observed data um, that we were kind of expected to, to reproduce. Those those kind of became targets, also, um, other other than the other targets that we've already talked about. And tra that transition from this observed data to simulated data, uh, we really struggled with. Um, we found that we had to do some special things in the first couple of years to make it match what we were really seeing on the ground, particularly with the, as the economy was coming back, there were certain communities that were really booming, others were, you know, were not, and the model was not reflecting that. And um, I, I think it would be really hard to capture uh, it just in the model, so we had to kind of manually, you know, do those things. Go ahead. Just adding a little bit more on the 
evolving data needs, again, I said our ADM was under development. Consultants would come through and say, hey, can you, you've got a new model that can do anything in the world. We need projections 30 years from now on how many restaurant seats there are. Yeah. Like, sure, why not? Um, yes, tenure, race, ethnicity, all of that good stuff. Seats and capacity at a concert venue in 30 years from now. So this this raises the biggest question is this where are we headed? What is what sense of false accuracy are we creating out there in terms of feeding and creating these models that really I ended up saying no to all of those and saying no, cannot cannot do that, do not feel comfortable about it. But this is this piece of where does one stop? And ABM is kind of getting into that piece where the data needs are just immense. And whether it's funds, which is we don't have much, we have all kinds of problems. That's just the beginning. On the employment side and everything else, the problems get even worse. And let's see, we have a little slide here on the real estate development model. I think I just covered this this first point here, sampling weights were a big deal for us and to get those adjusted correctly. Um, also the the transition model that computed demand for space. Um, it's actually computing demand on last year's uh, results, essentially, and we found that we really needed to insert, you know, this year's or even next year's control totals into uh, what it was using to compute um, the, the vacancy rates and, and things, so it would develop enough. Uh, we were finding that the, uh, you know, some of the increases in population, um, the model wasn't expecting and didn't quite develop enough for it. Um, so we had to you know, work around that a little bit. Um, and plus some the active and known development information we had to incorporate, redevelopment areas were challenging. Um, so real estate, real estate development in general was just a really, really tough problem for us to, us to deal with and it's something we're, gonna, we're looking at and changing. And the other piece, again, we are we're a lot like Houston and Albuquerque in terms of available land. We've got a lot of available land out there. One of the largest parcels uh, under one single land ownership is Pinal County is 275 square miles. That can that can hold about a billion people, and and that's one parcel. If that gets selected by the developer model to start building, they're building units like crazy, and there there are people not moving in, households aren't occupying that, and so this. The one piece we're looking forward to finding is, is there infrastructure or possibility to create infrastructure to aggregate and disaggregate parcels while the system is doing its thing, figuring out, okay, I can just subdivide parcels because in our system, we were stuck with that geography. So we had kind of subdivided it up front, but then the idea was that we've already loaded with answer. So it's, the model system isn't really deciding how much to take off that chunk. We had already decided what that chunk was. And yeah, we just have, uh, I think our next step slide here is almost it. Um, you know, the fact is we're facing being back in this production mode in just a couple of years. And uh, it sounds like we have a lot of time, but we don't. We, we need to make some changes and do them pretty quickly um, and, and get back into this. Um, the, some of the steps we're looking at is developing an in-house regional economic model and demographic models. Um, those refinement tools that I talked about earlier uh, are going to be a big deal for us. Um, some of that big ugly data slide that I brought up, we'd like to integrate some of that in, in some way and try to get some metadata out of it so we can preserve some of the history of what we did. Real estate development models we just talked about, uh, some more enhancement on the demographic evolution models needs to be done, and uh, analysis and visualization tools are, are big on our list. This is sort of our short list of things we'd like to address in the next year, and it's uh, a lot of work, I think. And the last one's done. Yeah, right. <laughs> So that's that's all we have, really. Um, we can take questions, or comments now. Nursing homes and 
dorms was one of them. Yeah. <laughs> that we maintain that we have the development projects module that runs development projects by different types. A certain amount of thing that goes into those is that based on analysis that we've done as to how much stock historically how much growth has gone into known versus unknown development projects. We have a ton of developments already approved sitting on the books. Now with the downturn, a lot of them went through bankruptcies or foreclosures, but as the market was turning while these projections were being done, one saw a lot of them coming back. Tempe, where ASU is, that's the biggest university, they actually had a number of projects come in in terms of redevelopment. That's the prime redevelopment area, particularly now with the light rail coming into downtown Phoenix, connecting Tempe and going into Mesa. There's this new transit line that has gone in, and a number of cities went ahead and started changing their general plans and densities, and they would start thinking about POD and all of that stuff. Now, interestingly, a lot of them went on the far side where they really have some of the densities in the and we're hearing from the market, from developers, that that kind of density is impossible. And so, you know, so we kind of have to uh, dampen down what the reality is from the zone of the world. Yes? This question is kind of a question for all things This idea that in a 20 or 30 year model, that we're going to get to these sort of ex-urban parcels that have to get them developed, conceptualized, and being developed, whatever the way to are. You made a presentation at ACSP where you show functionality that can subdivide and even put roads on some of these ex-urban um, environments. And one second, I'm going to go very, very quickly again. It's just like kidding me. Um, where is that? Yes. 
start the answer when I get a possible question from someone that can afford to ask this story. And the answer is, if I could tell you that, I wouldn't have to work for a minute. No, seriously. Um, example I can think offhand, we did experience some changes that the model was showing, which then we ended up talking to the jurisdictions around. There are certain areas in, in the county which are very heavy seasonal. And as the pricing and everything else was changing, the model started predicting that seasonal units turning into resident units. And then we discussed that with the jurisdictions and they kind of agreed with that. We saw that piece but at that level. But at the high level we didn't examine that, but that's I think something that we should be doing more. Yeah, I think, um, too, with the aging population side, uh, we get, uh, <clears throat> in our case, we had a lot of input into the uh, cohort component model that the Arizona State Demographer used. So I think that was, you know, uh, you know, the process that, that we went through with them just to get that model up and running can, you know, reflect some of those things. So that's why we had a little bit of input into that. One of the but, things we plan on getting more into is developing an explicit regional econometric model at the high level. And stops looking at those trends and say, where does one see what are the implications on the other one? This discussion here with I kind of want to a question involving the document. That's why it seems to be good. Another way of looking at it is the standard of the 
Yeah, the demographer, they did produce um, three sets of numbers, actually, it, um, the high, medium, and low forecast. Um, as part of the official process, we didn't do any of that experimentation. Something we planned to do. <clears throat> Thanks.
it's really easy. Up to, well, it's not technically developing, it's developed. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I'm interested in serious discussion. I know Brazil a little bit. Um, Florianopolis. Um, are, are you from uh, Argentina? Or? No, no, I spent okay. a lot of time down there uh, for other reasons. But um, are you going to be <laughs> switching between um, applications? Yeah, okay. yeah. Then I'll okay. just do so desktop. Yeah. I've got R set up on there, and I got a couple of animations. Very free flowing style. So in that case, if you ever do come back to your desktop, it will. Yeah, every will see it momentarily. But if you switch between tabs or whatever, then you, it'll. You know, you'll see it. it doesn't matter. Hey, you can just minimize myself wall. I guess okay, so it's ready to go on yeah, your side. Okay, so let's just make sure that this works. Oh, let me get the power out because I think I'm getting down. Yeah, it's probably a good idea. Alrighty. Sorry I didn't come earlier. I had a meeting this morning oh, that's okay. in Berkeley at 9, and then I was just kind of trying to run over here. I guess we could have probably done something this morning. I'm good to go. All right. So, what is this screen I'm looking at? What is that? Oh, this is the Google um, Google. You, you can just the meet up. That. Don't okay. close it, but just collapse it, and you don't need to worry about that. Okay. So I'll just start running these and see how that goes. How's that work? Um, sure. Are they looping back? Okay. Well, I won't say much about it either. I, I'll just a uh, little bit about my background, I guess. Oh, sure. Testing. Testing, testing. Hello? Hello? Testing. Okay, right. sounds good. Tyler? Okay, thanks. 
I'm actually not going to show any of that. I'm just this is this is just entertainment right now. <laughs> okay, hello. Um, I, feel free. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and do a very free flowing kind of a uh, um, shooting from the hip here this morning. Uh, uh, my name is Tyler Frazier. Um, I'm currently a, a researcher at the Santa Fe Institute in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, before that, I was um, a, a scientist, a researcher also at the TU Technische Universität in Berlin um, for three years. And then prior to that, I wrote my doctorate in Bonn at the Center for Development Research um, in Bonn. And so as part of uh, my work in Germany, Berlin and, and Bonn, um, I have been focused very much on cities in Africa and um, very much on this relationship between modeling and understanding the complexity of cities and, and in its very uh, high, uh, in its disaggregate. Um, and so, of course, Urban Sim is, is an excellent tool for, for, for this. And not only just uh, from the standpoint of um, understanding the complexity of informal settlements and cities in West Africa and, and South Africa and East Africa and India as well and a little bit in South America, um, but also how, how it, it interacts with policy and, and assists stakeholders and, and uh, institutions to understand their lo the dynamics of their local environment so that they can select their future and a preferable future. Uh, so here, um, and then prior to that, um, I'm a professional planner, um, did my master's at Georgia Tech in Atlanta, um, worked in Florida. I'm from Florida originally and have um, uh, worked as a land use planner in both the private and public sector, uh, primarily in, in Florida, um, doing a lot of comprehensive planning and stuff like that and DRIs. And, um, so I, even though uh, today um, we may see some sigmas and some conditional probabilities and some things like that. I, I, I think it's important to recognize that I'm a planner as well, so I'm coming at this from a, what I like to think a practical perspective. So here we have the, the urban sim of, of Accra, and I'm just, I'm just going to show this to you. This is, not, this is not what I intend to talk about at all today. Um, but just to give you kind of an idea of, of the type of work that I focused on when, um, uh, when I was in Accra, and looking at informal settlements and income and the informal sector and jobs, this one in the middle uh, is, is making some predictions about um, employment in the informal sector in a part of Accra called uh, Old Fatima or Ogbog Blashi. And then um, using, these, uh, using these predictions, and it, it goes out for 25 years, it's probably pretty far into the future to be realistic, but still using these predictions and historical data from about 200,000 um, meters throughout Accra and this one particular uh, part of Accra. So just to give you a little bit more background on Ghana, Accra is, is the capital city of Ghana. It's about four million people and this particular district on the right hand side is about a quarter of a million people. Um, so looking at land use, the land use classification, uh, the demographics, um, uh, jobs, uh, real estate value, and then using that, those as the variables to predict um, electricity demand. So that gives you a little bit of a background. But actually, I'm not going to talk about that all at all today. So I'm just going to close all that down for now. 
I think there have been some fantastic simulations here. And so um, instead, what I really want to talk about today are three things. And really, this is coming more from um, the research side. Um, and um, I just have some ideas here I want to start with. And I think this is actually a pretty important um, area right now where there seems to be a lot of conflict uh, in terms of cities and understanding cities and um, how, how science, the social sciences and, and the natural sciences seem to have a, a little bit of difficulty communicating right now. Um, and really, I think it really gets down to this question of, of looking at human behavior and human decisions uh, from, from more of the, what I'll call the modern perspective, which physics and mathematics is very heavily um, rooted in, uh, which is more of a reductionist, materialist view of nature, uh, versus a more transcendental view, actually going into the eyes of the people who live in, in my case, within an informal settlement and making predictions uh, from that perspective. So I just wanted to touch on that uh, conflict there of, of a kind of a more postmodern view of the world, which is more transcendental, versus this more modern view, uh, which is more materialistic and natural. And then I don't think this is this is actually the slide I'm just going to throw in here, but uh, I think it's important to kind of state what is the goal of my work. Um, and the fourth thing uh, here, I think, is really an important point to make is, is how how models and how understanding complex systems. Um, is serving to inform and add value um, so that local governments and local stakeholders can be engaged to select a preferable future for themselves. Okay, so here's a little bit about Ghana. So that's just kind of an introduction. And um, so I'm, but going straight from that, again, this is kind of different topics here. I'm going to talk about three different things. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is developing a classification system um, in order to index neighborhoods and exactly what variables that um, are, are, are I can use in order to develop an index um, that determines and classifies whether or not this particular neighborhood is an informal settlement or a slum um, or not. And then in doing that, um, using that uh, in order to make better predictions for rural to urban migration and talking a little bit about coherency and systems of cities and things like that. Um, and the other thing I want to talk about is a methodology that I've been working on for developing synthetic populations. Um, and so I'll talk about that a little bit as well. So here is a, um, here's Ghana. This is actually my introductory slide. Um, long introduction, yeah. <laughs> It's uh, Ghana here on the left-hand side. It's subdivided into 170 districts, um, 12,438 enumeration areas, and 102,948 localities. Um, so for Ghana, we have um, a living standard survey, which, compromise, which uh, comprises of about 40,000 individual persons, which is a 1.5% sample um, of the entire population across all of these 12,000 enumeration areas. And the, the survey itself actually um, is, I think, like five to 800 different questions or variables or something like that. But today, I'm only going to going to look at about 15 of them. So that gives you a little bit of an idea. Uh, so here on the left is Ghana. And then the box is zooming into this particular part along the coast of Ghana. Um, in between Kumasi and Accra, which is heavily urbanized, uh, urban sprawl is pretty, pretty, pretty serious in this look in this area. Um, infrastructure and things like this are, are not uh, the level of services are very low, I guess you could say. And then in this particular place over here is actually uh, Nima Town. Um, and if if anyone's done any work, I think there are a few people here who have done some work. Um, with informal thinking about informal settlements and development research and development economics and stuff like that. Um, Keith Hart, who was 
living in Accra, and he coined the term the informal economy or informal sector. This is actually where he was um, in in Nima Town. So it's a it's an important uh, location in West Africa. Um, okay, so this is the first thing I want to introduce, and here we're looking at at distributions of indexes, and so there are five different um, distributions here. One, two, three, four, five, and I think one of the first things you'll notice here is it's kind of difficult to differentiate between the one that's furthest to the left and the one that's to the right, because there are three somewhere in the middle um, that kind of all overlap one another. And I think that's, that's one of the things this slide is saying, is that you, in, in cities in the developing world, there's a very large portion that's somewhere in the middle. And how can policy actually affect these, these neighborhoods and these locations? So we're moving more to the left. So we're, we're getting uh, better quality of neighborhoods. Um, services are better. Um, wastewater services there. Um, stormwater services there. Schools are there. You know, all these things that actually play in to how um, the quality of, you know, what is the actual quality of a neighborhood. And understanding that from a, from a scientific perspective, I think it's pretty important, because then this links policy to being able to understand, is this, are these policies effective in their disaggregate? You know, are, are we, what is the actual benefit based on this cost of $1,000 or $2,000 or whatever it is? Um, and uh, so that's the first thing I just wanted to um, show a little bit is, is this index of neighborhoods and thinking about neighborhoods along a continuum. Um, not only in Africa, but I think also in the United States. This, this is, um, it's, it's the same continuum, it's just it's in a different location. Um, okay. So now I'm going to jump to a little bit different topic, and that's uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about generating close to reality synthetic human geographies. So um, one of the first things I realized when trying to model rural to urban migration and then thinking about how people make intra-urban decisions, whether they want to relocate from one location to another, is that it's kind of important to have a fairly heterogeneous population. Um, and so I thought a lot about iterative proportionate fitting and then resampling with replacement. And I found that I wanted to try to do something a little bit different. I wanted a very heterogeneous population. And in order to do that, um, I started to realize when you have a survey, you have a sample, there are going to be some persons in the, in the real population with some qualities that aren't represented in that sample itself. So how can I actually um, include combinations in this last, this last bullet point here, the motivation, how can I generate combinations which are not represented in the sample but are likely to exist in the real population? And um, this is very important because if you have a man or a woman, he's going to work, maybe a woman's going to school, um, there can be a lot of, there can be a very, um, people just are by nature very um, heterogeneous. So I, I was trying to come up with a solution for how to create a more heterogeneous synthetic population. Um, and here's the sample itself, and, and these are the observations and the number of outcomes uh, that I used. And so in order to do it, um, this is, and I, I've worked on this with a colleague of mine from, uh, who's now at, in, 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 in Amsterdam, uh, but at the time he was in Vienna in the statistical department there. So um, this is the basic approach to it right here, but I think what I'm going to do, so first we have um, just sampling with replacement, and then this bottom uh, formula is a multinomial logistic regression, and then using that in order to, to predict the conditional probabilities of each of these categorical variables. But let me, let me make this a little bit simpler. So this is the basic process right here. Um, so we have 
Ghana is subdivided into 12,000 enumeration areas. And we have a, um, random, uh, a random sample from, from each of, uh, from, uh, there's a weight for each of those different locations. So first, this is what I did. Just draw from each of those locations, and I had to aggregate a little bit in order to, to, um, to do it correctly. Um, the age, um, male or female, and then the household size, and take the weights and build just a basic household structure for the population within that spatial location. Then um, use um, uh, the multinomial, de develop the multinomial log logistic, logistic regression in order to predict the probability of all the outcomes of a categorical variable. So right here I'm uh, I'm using household size, number two, sex and age to predict religion for that location. Once you do that, for every single possible um, person um, throughout the entire country, throw religion in, in with the other three variables and then predict ethnicity. And then just keep doing this and doing this and doing this until you've uh, created all of the different demographic characteristics of the population um, for the entire country. And then uh, what we found is that actually discretizing income is probably best to do that last and then use all those um, variables to predict income as well. And then by doing that, uh, I generated 22 million persons uh, across 7 mil million households in 12,000 locations. And they match. I think that's very important that the persons and households actually match. Um, there's there's not a hierarchical hierarchical problem there, and also the zero cell problem. Um, don't have that as well. So I'll just show you a little bit of R. Let's see, is this right? Okay, here we are. Um, so here are the um, parameters from the model, and here we can see the frequencies of the alternatives for for here. I'm just predicting religion. So uh, in Ghana, religion is very important. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I think it's 11 outcomes. Um, let me just zoom down here and kind of see it in action here a little bit. Um, so here are the predictors on the left-hand side. So if we had a one-year-old male baby who's living alone in a household, which is, of course, not going to happen, but um, shouldn't be happening. Um, the, the probability of, of, I forget what the first one was, of the first religion is less than 1%. The probability of the next, I think that's Catholic, uh, about 14%. Um, if we go over to number four, that's Muslim, it's about 11%. Um, so you throw the dice, throw it in there, this baby is Muslim, you know, based on this location. And then once we have that outcome, incorporate that into the synthetic population and just keep doing it and doing it and doing it until the entire population has been constructed. Uh, seems to work pretty good. Let's see here, I'll go back here. And here's some validation. Um, we can see that the sample and the population match pretty good on the left hand side. Um, some box and whisker plots for, for from, so below is the sample. Um, and then above is the population that was synthetically generated. And I have a paper on this as well if anybody's interested to, to um, uh, I can make it available, available to you, it's open access. Um, and so here we're looking at, oh goodness, this is income. Income by region. And you can see that they're fairly, um, oh I'm sorry, on the left hand side is income per region and the right hand side is income per ethnicity. Um, so probably a lot of these eth eth uh, ethnic group names aren't going to make a whole lot of sense, but um, to most people here. So Akon on the bottom, this is one of the largest population groups in Ghana. Uh, Eve, which is the uh, third from the bottom, is also a large group, mostly in the southern part, um, and some other groups there. And then after that, uh, so here we have education and occupation as well. Um, that's income um, per, per occupation and income per education. 
there's some issues there, but the, for 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 all intents and purposes, I think it's okay. Um, and here we're looking at some mosaic plots on the left hand side of um, male, female, and household size household size for each of the regions, and then on the right hand side, uh, occupation. And I think the main two two things to say about this. First of all, they basically look about the same. And the second thing is that on the right hand side, the mosaic plots of the popu under the population, there are combinations in there that are very different from what was in the sample itself. But it but the overall instance here is reflecting uh, that instance of the probability model. So I, I think that's a kind of an interesting point. Um, and then the final thing I want to just talk about today, the third thing, is talk a little bit about scaling. Um, and this is the last slide um, I'm going to be presenting today. Um, thinking a little bit about scaling and how, uh, whether or not a system of populations or cities within a particular region um, <coughs> scales, so to speak, in, in terms of meeting certain power laws and things like that. And if it does, indeed, um, scale, it, what is, is it coherent? Is this a coherent system, and what are the implications of that towards rural to urban migration? Um, and so this is actually a slide from Michael, one of Michael Batty's uh, works. He actually gave it to me. So um, I'm working on that for the cities in Ghana. Uh, he's done some work with Nigeria, and I'm very interested to kind of cross over in, in that area as well. So that's all I had to share with you today. I know it was a lot of stuff from a lot of different, different um, places, but I just thought I'd kind of shoot from the hip and see how it goes. Yeah. They just have a working paper in uh, ah. um, Jobbers who from simulation based uh, what they call simulation based population synthesizer. Uh -huh. I think we could probably take the similar approach. Uh, mm. use MC and C to draw from traditional For those of you that probably don't know me, I'm a recent alumni of the Urban Sim team. Has been uh, with Urban Sim for ten years. 
Okay, uh, I'm always joking that I cannot get enough. That's why I keep coming back. <laughs> so I will get a little bit technical uh, on the Erickson side. Uh, th I think this is something that will be quite interesting, especially when we get to the developer model. I think that come up quite a lot. Uh, how we can get developer model to behave more realistically by moving towards uh, a more perform based uh, approach where we could uh, kind of try to mimic how real investors, developers make decisions. So we now need to have the price signal do some heavy lifting. And then the question is whether we can get the price signal behave uh, reasonably well. So this is trying to crack that problem. Okay. So entirely household looking choice model with uh, price equilibration as uh, collaborative work with Paul. Uh, so just a quick look of um, the very crude classification of how uh, other models, including Erbenson, how models, uh, land use models, uh, model uh, price or handle price uh, dynamics to help um, motivate the, the work uh, where we did here. So there are aggregate and disaggregate models. Uh, there are models where we don't model, we don't care price at all. Uh, then there is uh, equilibrium uh, approach and then disequilibrium approach. Uh, those are, I think uh, some of those names are uh, for models that were known, like Prentice, Middle Scope, and so on. They're more take an aggregate approach where the the consumer, the households, for example, in the case of a residential real estate market, they are aggregate into different buckets. They are the, the those demands are kind of allocated to different um, markets, sub markets, and then trying to come out with a, a price that clear the market. Uh, that's what we call an uh, aggregate approach. Then there is this this aggregate approach. We already look, uh, or you probably already know. We over uh, yesterday and today we probably say a bit of Urbanson uh, kind of micro simulation disaggregate approach, uh, where the consumer is individuals, uh, uh, and we trying to for one trying to represent uh, a more um, Disaggregate and every individual could have their own heterogeneous taste, some variation there. Um, on the other hand, we are taking a, a disequilibrium. Uh, we, be, we believe that the market are not perfectly, or the price are not moved to perfect clear the market uh, in every step of the simulation yet. Uh, but there is definitely kind of ideology preference for one or the other approach. Uh, we are not ready to decamp to the uh, equilibrium camp yet. Uh, so we're trying to see whether we can do something that's uh, kind of in the middle ground between those two uh, approach. As you may know, currently Urban Sim has been using or has always been using uh, a hedonic price model to model the, the price uh, in real estate market. So it's a very simple linear regression model uh, where the dependent variable is the real estate price. It, it, it apparently has a lot of advantage. Uh, it's very simple. It's robust. robust, uh, And it also it's very well grounded on economic theory. Uh, it has been uh, based on well-cited uh, econ paper, so uh, by Rosen. And it of Apparently, it has its advantage, as we will show you a little bit uh, in later part of my presentation, that it could be problematic when we model when, when there are demand or supply shock uh, in real estate market means there are change in demand or supply where we actually move from the base year equilibrium to probably to another uh, equilibrium, uh, and also uh, maybe in a long-term simulation where that assumption could be problematic. The objective here for this kind of work is to 
provide a modular real estate demand model with a price equilibration uh, for urban sum so that you can easily switch on and off with this. You can, if you are happy with uh, the hedonic price approach, you can stick with it. Uh, if you want to try uh, a new, this try this new price equilibration approach, you can easily, by changing one parameter uh, in your model configuration, you can easily switch to a uh, switch on, switch the price equilibration on. So by doing this, we hope to be a to enable the comparison and assessment of equilibrium uh, uh, or prediction of real estate price movement, um, and and to do some assessment of those two different approach to see whether to move beyond more like ideology ideology or prefer preference to be a more pra pragmatic uh, discussion of whether equilibrium or disequilibrium is better. Uh, I will get a little bit into the mathematics. Uh, so the in terms of the equilibrium equilibration problem is basically just a problem to adjust the price in the utility function. Uh, in the case, think about how uh, in disaggregate models, how uh, demand is modeled through uh, a discrete choice model where you where we have a utility function so we essentially it's just a price in the utility function so that the discrepancy between the supply and demand is minimized so that we, what we call a market is clear so it's essentially represent as a mathematically it's trying to find a minimum a price that minimizes that target function where we hopefully the price will be within a reasonable bound. It should not go beyond zero. Um, probably zero is not a reasonable lower bound, but it should not be billions of dollars per square feet, for example. Uh, and those are the essential uh, mathematic notation there. And here I I use I here I essentially the amount of supply are aggregate or uh, are summarized at a submarket level where the submarket you can define whatever way you like uh, it could be super parcel like uh, the uh, mag is using here in the barrier test or barrier application actually uh, we used a, a rather a combination of uh, attributes to define those submarket including school district tenure, building type, and whether the property or the housing, in this case, is within half mile of uh, transit stop, yeah, of any transit stop. And in the discrete choice, in the context of discrete choice model, the demand is modeled by a MMO, multinomial logic model, and we can summarize the demand by uh, using the closed form Close form MML uh, probability, so that's uh, how you write out, and we assume you know short term in a, uh, in a one simulation step in our case a year that whenever you can you, there's still flexibility of whether you run the supply model or the real estate developer model before or after uh, in the end of in the beginning of the year or end of the year, but we assume. Given that the real estate, the real estate developer model has been run, that the, the supply is fixed in the short uh, run, within that uh, simulation step or in the process, this uh, household hand choice model is run, and is running. So, in the collaboration problem, then can be solved by just finding the price that uh, optimizes the objective function or minimizes the objective function in that case. But that could be rather computationally uh, costly. Uh, I could be thinking about that. We probably need to find uh, or iterate the price for thousands or tens of thousands of agents uh, across all submarkets. And if we are willing to make one uh, last assumption, uh, that is where the price. Uh, is a linear over utility is a linear function of price, which actually is what we usually do. Uh, 
uh, in our previous modeling work, but allowing that we can we can do market segments. We allow the uh, we will be able to still use some models to capture the uh, difference in test or difference in preference or uh, in against price. So you still allow even to extreme, you can use a mixed logic model so that every individual have their own coefficient for price and, and so on. So with that assumption in place, we can actually find the, the first order derivative uh, use a closed form uh, function. So that is helpful uh, in the, if you know how optimizer works. Uh, that when we have the first order derivative, we can use that to help us rapidly speed up the defining the minimum uh, or the price that minimizes the objective function or discrepancy between demand supply or, in other words, uh, clear the market. So that's what it looked like. For those of you that are mathematically inclined, you can uh, find more in our paper. Ideally, we want to test whether this, the, this new price equilibrium is work as expected, we want to check, either do, ideally do a back cast, kind of go back to 2000 or some, some historic years, run a simulation and compare the predict versus against, against the observed price. But this is hard to do um, because we usually we don't have those data uh, across two time points, uh, price across time, two time points. Uh, on the other hand, it's very hard to isolate what factors has been changed between uh, two simulation points because there are way too many in reality when we observed price at two points. There are so many factors that actually influence the price. So. The model uh, in our model input is very hard to capture those uh, all those factors. So we cannot, if there are discrepancies between those two, between the predict and observe, we can not isolate whether it's an input input problem or it's a problem in our uh, uh, method. So we instead we resort to a sensitivity test to to do some comparison across different scenarios to see whether the, the price equilibrium approach is producing uh, reasonable sensitivity uh, against uh, a few scenarios we choose here. So we have a baseline where we, we turn the price equilibrium off and we have a building type conversion. Uh, it's Again, those two scenarios are hypothetical. So we convert 30% of single family housing into multi family housing. So this is kind of just make a switch to change the flag of the building type from single family housing to multi family housing. So we will have a lot of multi family housing with one unit. So randomly pick uh, a, a, about a third of the single family housing and just switch flag. And we should expect that, given that we now have uh, a lot more supply of multifamily housing, we should see a, a price for multifamily housing decrease, a single family housing increase. Okay. And then uh, we have another scenario that's a higher income. We essentially give a 50% raise to every household across the board. Okay. So that's a little bit hard to anticipate what happened, but we kind of think that probably uh, the price should go up. Uh, probably the uh, higher uh, or higher priced housing should probably go up a little bit more than lower priced, but uh, it's it's less certain what, what will happen. Those two scenarios essentially one pre present one one example. Uh, in present examples in uh, both the supply shock where we kind of uh, have some supply change uh, change in the supply side as well as uh, uh, a demand shock where we actually have uh, uh, income the household's income has uh, some rather drastic change 
So this is the setup for the scenario test. We have three scenarios. We run a set of four models, and then we compare those results. Okay. And here is what it looked like from the hedonic price model. Okay, so the x-axis is baseline model. Uh, so the base, essentially in this example, it's the base year in the log scale, uh, the price in the log scale. And the y-axis is what the hedonic price model will predict, uh, the, the price versus against the base year uh, price. Okay, so we have uh, three different types of housing in the left chart that's the uh, building type conversion example uh, remember that uh, we have now 30% more multi family 30% uh, of single family housing kind of artificially converted to multi family housing the we can see that the prediction results is kind of uh, very still very clustered or uh, very similar to the base year data uh, it's it's hard to see a trend on what act, what's actually happening here. So those are very clustered around the the diagonal line means that it's uh, exactly the same as the base year uh, prediction of this year observed data. And in terms of the higher income uh, scenario, that we see a kind of a parallel shift. That's probably just added artifact of how the what what variables are in the hedonic regression model income essentially are included as just a household income or average household income are included in the hedonic price model as just one independent variable okay and look at how uh, price equilibrium approach will predict that we will see that the the Triangle, the modern family housing are largely below the diagonal line, means they are predicting a lower value than the base year. And the single family, a single family housing are largely above the diagonal line, means the single family housing price are higher in the predicted value than the base year, uh, or in, than the baseline price. Okay, uh, and in terms of higher income, uh, the converged price versus baseline that we see uh, that in terms of the trend that we can see that the higher priced housing are uh, deviate or have a larger deviation in from the diagonal line than a lower priced uh, housing. Okay, that's, I think that's something that we will expect. Okay. Uh, and quickly, rather quickly, given that we have rather limited time, so a, I think this is a rather simple, um, but have uh, some behavior that a realistic provides a realistic way or realistic price prediction without sacrifice uh, any representation of the heterogeneous agents household are, are still represent as uh, individual household and the spatial resolution can be if you want to go to the extreme it can still you can still use parcel although that could probably produce some rather drastic variations especially when with the sampling of alternative turns on but the spatial resolution can be go as low as parcel or building if you want to. Uh, and then we provide a more programmatic, programmatic way to, uh, towards those uh, equilibrium or uh, disequilibrium discussion uh, in modeling real estate demand. And we believe it uh, provides a, a more reasonable way to model those uh, price movement uh, in terms of uh, shocking than the current implementation. Uh, those are important when we, especially when we want to model the realistic uh, development in a more realistic way. Modularity, I believe we achieve that goal, that objective. Uh, and this is not limited to just limited to just the household location choice model. It's built on top of the discrete choice mod model 
uh, implement in urban STEM, so it could have a much wider application. Uh, it could easily adapt to use in the renters market, in the non-residential non real estate market. It has, uh, I put in, this is a slide that pre prepared last year for last year's TRB presentation. We put in good computation performance, but we probably now should change where it's okay computational performance, uh, given Flater's presentation yesterday. Uh, and I think it's still, it's still not so bad, given that we run four models uh, together, and uh, that's essentially how the King choice model part with the price equilibrium. So it takes four and a half minutes uh, for the Bay Area data. Uh, and, and in terms of this equilibrium or disequilibrium question, I think some preliminary results we have found is that it's probably some middle ground. Uh, uh, we believe in our test that a middle ground probably produce a, a more reasonable or, or more realistic results than either a full equilibrium approach or uh, a non-equilibrium approach. If that's probably something that will, will further investigate as a, as a research project. Of course, A has some limitation. Uh, a, we, have, we have at least two essential assumptions. One is the MML assumption, uh, and the other is the linear price. Those are, I, I think, those are in, in some cases are restricted. Uh, but uh, I think those two uh, are rather common practice in, in land use modeling, uh, both MML and the price and the model specification use a linear in price assumption. Uh, it is rather common. If you want to move uh, away from that, uh, it's still possible to do, but now the optimization process will be much slower. We haven't established or we haven't proved that uh, this approach will, will arrive at unique e equilibrium yet, uh, but our test has been that we'll be able to, starting from very different starting points, we can still arrive uh, at the same equilibrium results. So we haven't, we will still probably to be more rigorous for academic research. We'll need to uh, do a little more on that, but uh, so far, we, we th it, it seems to be that there is a unique equilibrium. The a larger limitation, or uh, something that we we'll probably need to think about, is modeling price dynamics will open up a Pandora's box, uh, so to speak, uh, that when you really actually trying to model the price, how the price will change in real estate market, you will need to think about other models for only on one hand. Other models that influenced by or uh, affected by price, for example, tenure choice, relocation model, uh, that needs to be, be incorporated into the price equilibrium uh, process because now, given the price is different, that people will make decision regarding whether they want to relocate, whether they want to choose to rent versus to own a house. Okay, and also other factors that influence uh, price. Uh, now, income becomes something we maybe needs to be needs to be incorporated or needs to be modeled in one of our model component. Whether we should consider inflation. Uh, in our model, so that that where the end line is uh, is a problem. And if you want to need to, want to dive a little more on this, we have a, a TRB presentation. You can find uh, either I can I can send you a copy or you can find from the TRB website. So uh, the code uh, we implement the model. The code is available on our SP, SP, SPN repository. So, and with that, I will just open for questions. Thank you.
Yes. Uh, actually, I, I didn't hear the full part, the last part of your question. Uh, so, Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. 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 Uh, the 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 problem is uh, how far we want to go uh, in in terms of kind of uh, group group those agents or households uh, by by group. I think the disaggregate approach, the advantage of disaggregate approach is that it actually allow you to allow every household to have a different beta for price. Yeah, in that case, you can you can use mixed logic. Actually, even we talk about MML, but mixed logic should work exactly. Uh, use e this exactly approach so that every agent actually have a different beta, uh, so that we don't actually need to group them. To group those households into different buckets or different categories, we do need to make assumption that um, other variables or, or think about what independent variables are in the MML model uh, so that you, in, you can group those households with the same attributes. But with the, with this uh, disaggregate approach, you don't need to do that. And I think it's, uh, it's running sufficient, uh, sufficiently fast uh, with this uh, First order derivative, close form first order derivative. That's uh, a, yeah, very, definitely very good comments. Uh, there are, as I at least some example here as well, uh, household formation, and uh, I think particularly probably you're aware of in China where uh, housing by own a, a condominium is kind of prerequisite for marriage, for example. Uh, that kind of uh, definitely change other other parts of the uh, process. Yeah. You may want to be included in your model. Thank you again very much. The line between those that use aggregate equilibrium model and those that use. Disaggregate, disequilibrium approaches to this, and I think this begins to break down that barrier and allow us to uh, find sweet spots within that whole uh, algorithmic space, if you will, uh, that best fit the data. And I think we can afford to be a little bit more pragmatic about these things and not be too hard and fast in our attachment to uh, one or the other assumption. Uh, 
on and actually find out what mix of these things, where in that space uh, we actually find ways to, to fit reality best. And uh, I think that's a much more interesting place to be, um, more grounded in that space than simply making assumptions and, and uh, defending those assumptions uh, at great cost. Uh, so anyway, thank you, uh, Lenny, for that presentation and, and all the work behind it. Um, it's time for a lunch break, a well-deserved lunch break. You've had a long morning <laughs> sitting here. Uh, so we're going to, again, pick up at 1.30. So uh, we've got a full packed afternoon. But uh, you can be back here ready right to start at 1.30. That would be great. We're going to know your way around the restaurant, so uh, <coughs> no more instructions needed.